Welcome. Thank you all so much for coming this evening. Hopefully, everyone has found a seat, and uh, there are some empty seats for anyone who may be outside who hasn't or doesn't have a ticket. Um, let's make sure that everyone is seated uh, who wishes to be here. It's really an uh, extraordinary joy for me to be here uh, with one of my personal heroes, Thich Nhat Hanh, or Tay, as he is called by his students, is one of the best known and respected Zen masters. Uh, but in addition, he has spent his whole life promoting compassion, kindness to others, and being a tireless advocate for human rights, nonviolence, and peace. As many of you know, he's written a large number of books. He has spoken and taught around the world, and he's been a role model to so many people in their lives, and he's led an extraordinary life. The reason we're chatting today um, is because of a program that I run here at Stanford called Sea Care. And I think many of you may be aware of it, but um, if you don't, it's called the Center for Compassion and Altruism Research and Education. And this is a program we have here at Stanford where we work with neuroscientists, psychologists, and a variety of disciplines really trying to understand the neurologic basis of compassionate behavior. And also, uh, the reality is that when individuals are compassionate, it actually, as we found through science, uh, it's when our physiology works best. Um, one thing that we have found through science is that we can actually change our brain through mind training. Now, of course, the fascinating thing is that it's taken scientists hundreds and hundreds of years, and if we had just looked back, which we are, of course, now doing to the monastic traditions, they, of course, knew this all along, and uh, only now we are actually catching up. And in fact, many of these contemplative traditions, uh, the entire basis is oriented around compassionate behavior because they have known, and we have now shown through science, that when we're compassionate, not only does it improve the lives of others and serve others, but it is of great benefit to each of us. It makes us feel better. It lowers our blood pressure. It makes us happy at a very, very deep level. And in fact, as we're now learning, it also increases our lifespan. And the amazing thing is that many of the greatest things that promote a happy life are actually things that are completely free and available to all of us every day. Now, I appreciate that few of you are here to really hear me talk this evening. <laughs> um, so what I would like to do is uh, turn the evening over to Tay, and then uh, we'll have a little bit of a conversation, but I know that each of us will leave here today having learned something that will improve each of our lives and allow us to better serve our fellow man. So without further ado, Would you like to ask a few questions? <laughs> hmm. Um, yes. <laughs> it's always interesting, I think, to people, and I know, of course, some of your history, uh, but as I understand it, when you were quite a young age, um, 
you decided to become a monk and lead a monastic life. Um, and that, in many ways, a life that the average person has uh, a very difficult time thinking about the possibilities that they could even do that. But for you, what was it about that tradition or becoming a Buddhist that inspired you so much? Uh, I was uh, 16 when I uh, was ordained as a Buddhist uh, novice. I had learned that um, during the Li and the Tan dynasties, um, Buddhism was uh, flourishing. And uh, kings and uh, subjects and the population practiced Buddhism, and we had uh, many hundreds of years of peace. So that impressed me very much. And um, uh, I believed as a, a, young, a young man that uh, if you practice Buddhism well, you can serve your nation, your country, your people. And that is one thing. When I was younger, about uh, 11 or 12, one day I saw the drawing of uh, the Buddha uh, uh, in uh, the cover of a Buddhist magazine. He was sitting on the grass, very calm, very pleasant. I told myself I want to be someone like him. <laughs> because people around me were not as uh, calm, as uh, happy. And these things uh, were uh, have pushed me to become uh, a monastic. One of the challenges, though, I think, um, is you were in Vietnam during the Vietnam War, and, of course, uh, many of the monks stayed in the monastery. And uh, I know you have promoted if you will, engaged Buddhism or engaged spirituality. What made you decide to actually engage and uh, become an activist? And how did you overcome what I would presume fear about what might happen? When uh, the practice of Buddhism is uh, mindfulness, uh, concentration and insight. And mindfulness is the kind of energy that helps you to know what is going on. Going on in your body, your feelings, your perceptions, your mental formations, your consciousness. And going on around you, in your family, in your community, in your country. So if you are aware of what is going on around you, you see the suffering and you would like to do something in order to help people suffer less. And uh, I always, from, from the time becoming a monk, I wanted to have that kind of Buddhism that, uh, that, can, that can really help people, not Buddhist studies, but uh, the, the kind of practice that can really help you to suffer less and help people to suffer less. And that is why we have um, created uh, a um, current of thinking and of action called uh, Engaged Buddhism, the Buddhism Angashi. And uh, we study Buddhism and apply Buddhism in such a way that we can really solve the problems uh, we are facing in our uh, families, in our uh, communities, in our uh, society. You know, one of the challenges, though, I think for many people um, is that there is so much suffering. And as an example, I'm a doctor, and uh, uh, one of the things that happens to doctors, and especially people, if you will, in the caring professions, is they get overwhelmed with suffering, as does the average person. And they say there's so much suffering, but what can I do? Uh, 
people are afraid of being overwhelmed by suffering. And uh, they lose their hope, their courage, and so on. There must be a way uh, to live in order for you to, uh, to be strong enough, in order to, um, to, to handle the suffering inside of you. And if you don't know how to handle the suffering in, inside of you, you cannot help another person to suffer less. And that is why the practice of mindfulness, uh, first of all, is to help you yourself to suffer less. First of all, you have to learn how to release the tension in your body, how to reduce uh, the pain in your body. And the practice of mindful breathing, mindful walking, sitting meditation, uh, total relaxation uh, can be very helpful in reducing the pain uh, in your body. And then with the practice of mindfulness, you can, you can learn how to create, generate a feeling of joy and of, and of uh, happiness, or of happiness. And this can be done by anyone if uh, we, we want to, uh, to learn. Uh, for instance, when you uh, breathe in, and if you focus your attention on your in-breath, and then you can bring your mind home to your body. And there is the energy of mindfulness, concentration in your in-breath. And you realize that you are alive, because uh, someone who is already dead does not breathe in anymore. So uh, one in-breath that may last three or four seconds can create mindfulness, concentration, and insight. And um, when the body and the mind are together, you are established in the present moment, in the here and the now. And you can get in touch with the wonders of life that are available in the here and the now. And, and with that kind of mindfulness and concentration, you realize that you are lucky enough, luckier than many people. You have enough conditions to be happy right now, right here, and you don't have to run into the future to look for happiness. And that happens after three or four seconds of practice of mindful breathing. You get the insight that there are conditions of happiness that are available in the here and the now. You are very lucky, you are alive. Insight can, can happen just after a few seconds of practice. And if you recognize that uh, these uh, conditions of happiness are there available, so you can create a feeling of joy and of happiness right away. So a good practitioner of mindfulness can create a feeling of joy, a feeling of happiness for him, for her, and for the other person. And that is easy and enough. And then the mindfulness practice can help you to go home to yourself in order to, to get in touch with the pain, the suffering, the despair, the anger, the violence inside. And uh, with the energy of mindfulness and insight, you know how to handle the suffering within yourself. You are compassionate toward yourself. Because love for another person depends on your capacity to love yourself. If you don't know how to love yourself and take care of yourself, how can you love and take care of another person? So uh, the practitioner learns how to suffer how to handle the pain, suffering inside of him or her. And because he knows how to do that with uh, compassion, with insight, with uh, mindfulness, he can suffer much less than the other people who do not know the practice. And uh, he, can, he can go further. He can make good use of the suffering in order to create uh, something more positive, like understanding and compassion. It's like uh, people who grow uh, lotus flowers. 
they know how to make good use of mud in order to grow uh, lotus. No mud, no lotus. No suffering, no happiness, no compassion. So, so um, the practitioner generating the energy of mindfulness and concentration recognize the pain in him or in her and embrace it uh, tenderly. And the fact that you can recognize and embrace your pain can bring you a relief because the pain is a kind of energy and mindfulness is another kind of energy. This energy embracing the other energy will make, uh, produce a kind of change like a mother uh, holding her baby. The baby suffers. The mother does not know yet what is the cause of the suffering of the baby. But the fact that she's holding the baby tenderly can make the baby suffer less right away. Because that, there is the energy of tenderness from the mother penetrating into the body of the baby that, uh, that brings a relief. And if uh, she uh, continues with uh, mindful holding, and she will find out the cause that make the baby suffer. And then she can change the situation. So the practitioner, uh, while holding um, his pain, uh, her uh, anger, is like holding our own baby. We have to, to handle the suffering in us tenderly, with non-violence. We should not try to suppress uh, the pain. We should not uh, suppress our baby, our own baby. And uh, you get a relief. And if uh, you know how to practice, you can gradually transform uh, the pain, the, the, the anger, and the despair in you. So um, the practice of mindfulness helps people to, uh, to suffer in a such a way that they suffer much, much less than other people who do not know how to practice to get a relief and to make good use of the suffering in order to create understanding and compassion that are the very foundation of happiness. There is a deep uh, connection between suffering and happiness. It's like um, the connection between the mud and the lotus. If uh, you have the time to listen to your own suffering, to look deeply into the nature of your own suffering, understanding will arise. Understanding here means understanding of the suffering. And uh, when understanding arises, compassion is born. That is the, the mechanics of, uh, of uh, compassion. When you look at another person, if you have the time, and if you look at him or her mindfully and with concentration, you can recognize the suffering in that person. And if you are more concentrated, you can find out that that person does not know how to handle the suffering in him. And that is why he remains victim of his own suffering. So far, no one has helped him to handle the suffering in him. And if, since he suffers, he makes the other people around him suffer, even if he doesn't want to do so. So with mindfulness and concentration, you can realize, you can recognize the suffering in him and understand the suffering. And if that understanding arises, you are not angry at him anymore. and compassion, because compassion has been born in your heart. And when compassion is born in your heart, you don't suffer anymore. It's like a miracle. And instead of trying to punish him or her for having made you suffer, you want to say something or to do something in order to, to help him suffer less. And that can be done uh, in our daily life with the practice of mindfulness uh, and concentration. 
So if we understand our own suffering, and then it will be much easier for us to understand the suffering of another person and help him. And that is why the meditation on compassion, on suffering, should begin with yourself. Because our suffering carries within itself the suffering of our father, of our mother, of our ancestors. Maybe our father suffered so much and he did not know how to, ha- to transform and handle the suffering he has transmitted to you. And they are in your genes. And that is why you are a receiver of that transmission. You have to accept it. And if you know the practice, you will transform the suffering of your father in you, which is also your, your own suffering. And your suffering also reflects the suffering of your society, of your nation. And if you understand your own suffering, you understand the suffering of your community, of your nation, of your people. And that is why understanding suffering is very important uh, for compassion to arise. And once compassion um, is there, you suffer much less. And suffering um, has a positive role to say, to, 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 to do. Uh, we can speak about the goodness, the usefulness of suffering. It's like the goodness, the usefulness of, uh, usefulness of uh, the mud in helping producing lotus flowers. <coughs> And that's why my idea of the kingdom of God is not a place where there is no suffering. If there is no suffering, there is no happiness either. Uh, that is the teaching of interbeing. Interbeing. You cannot be by yourself alone. You have to interbe with us. The left cannot be by itself alone. The left has to be the, uh, to interbe with the right. If uh, you remove the right, the left disappears right away. If politically you are on the left, don't wish that the right would disappear. (laughs) (laughs) If the right disappears, you did disappear disappear also. (laughs) So that is the teaching of interbeing. Interbeing means you cannot be. You can only interbeing. And I think compassion is uh, like everything else. Compassion compassion cannot be by itself. When you look into a flower, you see the flower is made of non-flower elements, like a cloud. I can see a cloud, and I can touch a cloud in the flower, because all of us know that without the cloud, there will be no rain and no flower can grow. So when I look into the flower, I see non-flower elements, including the element of a cloud. I see the sunshine. I see the minerals, the earth, the gardener, and so on. Non-flower elements coming together in order to help the flower to manifest as a wonder of life. Compassion is a flower, and compassion is made of non-compassion elements. I think we all uh, at least uh, acknowledge that uh, some of our greatest poets, like yourself, Mm. some of uh, uh, the greatest humanitarians, and some of the people who we consider enlightened beings have suffered extraordinary amounts, and it is getting wisdom through that suffering and not I think running away from the suffering that uh, allows them uh, to do that. I think one of the challenges in modern society and one of the burdens we have are humans is one that you mentioned, which is if science has shown as an example when they've surveyed people that over 75% of the time they're thinking of the past or the future, they're not thinking of the present. And you talk about mindfulness, which brings us in the present moment, but I think sometimes people uh, look at somebody like yourself and say this is an individual who has spent literally decades of their lives dedicated to meditation, 
mindfulness practice. Uh, for the individuals who, uh, while they may look at your picture and want to be like you, uh, they may not be able to have the capacity uh, to become quite as enlightened, but what can individuals do in their daily lives? Does it really take hours and hours of deep contemplative practice, or can you practice mindfulness every moment? Well, everyone can, can, uh, can practice um, generating the energy of compassion in order to suffer less. Um, if we uh, have the courage to go back to ourselves and listen to our own suffering, and then we can begin to understand our suffering and begin to suffer less. Many of us do not want to do so. Uh, most of us are trying to run away from ourselves. Uh, because we believe that going home to ourselves will, um, mm, mm, we, may, we may be overwhelmed by the pain, the suffering, the despair inside. So most of people in our society try to cover up the suffering by, by, by the way of consuming. We consume music, newspapers, uh, food, internet, uh, everything that helps us not to go home to ourselves. And many of the items we consume uh, have uh, toxins like uh, anger, fear, despair, craving, and that make our suffering inside could continue to grow. So uh, the real practice is to try to go home without fear. And if you know how to practice mindful breathing, mindful walking, you can generate the energy of mindfulness and concentration, and with which you can go home to yourself without fear. You are protected by these energies. And if you are, a, if you are new in the practice, you can rely on the collective energy of mindfulness of, uh, of a community of practice. And then um, going home to yourself, uh, recognizing the pain in yourself, embracing the pain in yourself will bring you a relief. You can do that with the support of co-practitioners. Because when you, when, when you are in a community of practice, when you live with a community of practice where there are many practitioners know how to generate the energy of compassion, energy of uh, mindfulness, you can borrow that collective energy in order to recognize and embrace um, your pain and your sorrow. And that is why m compassion can be an individual uh, energy, but can be a collective energy. And uh, maybe scientists can, can, can measure <laughs> The degree, the intensity of uh, that kind of energy uh, when, when we practice in order to generate uh, the energy of, uh, of, uh, of compassion. We practice like um, a drop of water. A drop of water has to allow the whole river to embrace it and to transport it. So sitting in a community of practice, you say to yourself, dear community, dear brothers and sisters in the practice, here is my pain, here is my sorrow, my despair. My, my mindfulness is not strong enough to hold them. Please help me to hold my, my, my pain, my sorrow, my despair. And that is uh, in the tradition. Uh, if you want to practice well, you, you should have a community of practice supporting you and guiding you. Uh, and um, when you practice uh, a few weeks later, you can be on your own because, uh, because now you can generate your own energy of mindfulness and concentration in order to handle the, 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 the suffering in yourself. And uh, I think uh, 
Compassion has the power to heal. And compassion is never enough. In these days, uh, psychotherapists uh, talk about uh, compa- compassion fatigue. I think, uh, I think uh, if uh, psychotherapists uh, run out of compassion, <laughs> because they don't know how to keep producing compassion, it's not because they have too much compassion but because they run out of compassion. Compassion is kind of uh, power, of energy, and you should keep producing it if, uh, if, if uh, you need uh, to help many people. And uh, if, uh, if uh, psychotherapists do not know how to nourish themselves, I think they should know how to generate uh, feelings of joy and happiness every day to nourish themselves, to be strong enough, to continue. And the second thing they have to do is to know how to handle the suffering within themselves. Without that, uh, they will run out of compassion in a short time and cannot continue. And that applies to every one of us who want to serve society. We should be able to nourish ourselves by the art of happiness. There is an art called the art of happiness. And it's simple enough. We bring our mind home to our body by the way of mindful breathing, mindful walking, and we establish ourselves in the here and the now. Just by walking meditation or breathing meditation. And then in the here and the now, we get in touch with the wonders of life that are available in the here and the now. The kingdom of God that is in the here and the now. It's in order to get the nourishment you need. And you can help nourish your beloved one with that, that kind of thing. And then the art of suffering is, uh, should we go together with the art of happiness. You should know how to handle a painful feeling, a painful emotion, with the energy of mindfulness and concentration. And with uh, the practice of uh, mindfulness and concentration, embracing your pain, you suffer much less. You know how to bring a relief, and you can go, f- you can go further by trans- transforming this uh, energy into positive energy like understanding and love. I just talk about the kingdom of God uh, not as a place where there is no suffering, because it is my conviction that where there is no suffering, there is no happiness either. That is the truth of interbeing, like the left and the right, the above and the below, the subject and the object. Uh, you, we, we don't want to send our children to a place where there is no suffering. Because in such a place, our children have no chance to learn to be understanding and compassionate. It is by touching suffering, understanding suffering, that you can generate love and compassion. That is why my, my vision of uh, the kingdom of God is a place where people know how to make good use of suffering in order, in order to create understanding and compassion. And uh, in Plum Village, France, we uh, used to invite uh, groups of uh, Palestinians and Israelis to come and practice with us. And uh, it, it is always difficult in the, in the beginning because when the two groups come, they could not look at each other. They could not uh, talk to each other because both the group have a lot of uh, anger and fear and suspicion, the suffering. So the, 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 um, during the first week, we let them stay um, Separate. separately. And uh, first of all, the practice of mindful breathing, mindful walking helped them to calm down. Embrace the pain. 
and they are, they are guided to get in touch with the wonders of life within themselves and around them to get the nourishment they need. So to learn how to, to calm the painful feeling, the painful emotion, and how to get the nourishment that you need is what we do in the first week. And, when, and then we begin, we continue with looking deeply into our own suffering and find out where they have come from. Very, uh, very often they have come from our wrong perceptions. Wrong perceptions give rise to fear, anger, discrimination, and mindfulness, and, 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 com and uh, concentration have the power to bring insight. That insight can remove, uh, transform fear, anger, separation, and uh, discrimination. So um, beginning the second week, we initiate uh, these, uh, these people to the practice of uh, deep listening and compassionate, comp compassionate listening and loving speech. One group are asked to tell the other group, and many of us also about their suffering. And they are advised to speak out in such a way that can help people to, to understand. Try to avoid uh, blaming, uh, uh, um, accusing, and so on. You are invited to tell us about your suffering. You can tell us everything. The suffering of your children, the suffering of your adult, how your house has been bombed, and uh, how your children have been maimed, and so on. Please tell us everything. We are trying to listen to you, uh, Israelis or Palestinians or, or any other people. And many of us sit there to lend our support. Because if you have 100 people sitting and breathing and generating the energy of mindfulness and compassion, we support them because sometimes it's very difficult to speak out. And on the other side, uh, the other group, they will practice uh, deep listening, compassionate listening. And we have to train ourselves in order to listen. Because the other, what the other person, what the other group say may trigger the anger and the irritation in us. And we lose our compassion. We cannot continue to listen. That is why in order to listen, you have to get the insight alive, maintain the insight alive. I am listening to him with only one purpose, to help him to speak out and suffer less. And you have to maintain that, that, that uh, insight alive that is called mindfulness of compassion. So if you, if you maintain that compassion, mindfulness of compassion alive, then what the, the other person say will not trigger the irritation and the anger in you, and you can continue to listen for one hour or more. And you tell yourself that, well, he's full of wrong perceptions, but I'm not going to interrupt him right now, because if I do, and then I will transform the session into a debate that will ruin everything. In a few days, I may, um, I may have the time, occasion to release some information to help him to correct his perceptions, but not now. Now he's only listening. And that is the art of uh, compassionate listening that can help people suffer much less. And, uh, and uh, with, that, uh, with that practice, people suffer less right after the first session. When you listen to them, with mindfulness and concentration, you realize that on their side, on the other side, they have suffered exactly like on your side, children and adults. And the first time, you see that they are victims of the conflict, victims of wrong perceptions. Uh, and you are not angry at them anymore because compassion 
understanding, compassion is born in you, and you begin to look at. You do not suffer anymore when you look at them, and in your eyes there is the reflect of compassion. And when they see you looking at them like that, they suffer much less also. And that is a, like a miracle, and we need only ten days to do so. And then the, you see for the first time that the people on the other camp they are just human beings like like you, and who have suffered very much the same way you have suffered. So, mutual understanding become uh, possible. Communication become possible with uh, that kind of uh, contemplation of suffering. And you know that you have uh, a chance in order to speak about your suffering, uh, your difficulties, your despair, and the other group uh, can listen. And the practice can, can remove a lot of anger, remove a lot of uh, uh, suspicion, and remove a lot of fear. And they begin to be able to sit together, share a meal together, holding hand to do walking meditation, meditation together. It's like a miracle of healing, uh, how to, how to uh, help a compassion to, to be born and listen, listening to the suffering with mindfulness. Uh, um, you can, you can cause, you can help uh, the energy of compassion to be born. And then they experience um, transformation and healing. And all of us are so happy, uh, they do. And on the last day of the retreat, they come together as one group to report about the fruit of the practice to the whole community. And they always um, promise that when they go back to the Middle East, they will organize that kind of practice so that other Israelis and Palestinians will come and practice and suffer less. So that is uh, what uh, happened uh, during the time we host uh, these uh, two groups. In our, uh, in our retreats of mindfulness that are offered a little bit everywhere, in Europe, in Asia, and so on, in uh, America, Usually on the fifth day of the retreat, we ask people to apply the teaching of uh, deep listening and loving speech with the other person with which they have, with whom they have difficulties in order to restore communication. If the other person is in the retreat, that is easier because uh, he or she has also uh, 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 been exposed to the teaching and the practice. And if the other person is at home or some, someone, somewhere else, you can use your telephone in order to practice. Deep listening, compassionate listening, and loving speech. And uh, you call him, your father, and you say, Daddy, I know you have suffered quite a lot in the past many years. I was not able to help you to suffer less. In fact, I have made it uh, more difficult to you by reacting in such a way that makes you suffer more. Daddy, it's not my intention to make you suffer. It's because I did not understand your suffering. I did not understand your difficulties. That this is why I have reacted with that kind of stubbornness. I'm sorry. I need your help. Daddy, you should tell me about your suffering, your difficulties, your despair. You should help me. Because if I know that if I understand them, I will not react like the way I have in the past. Please help me. Uh, Father, if you don't help me, who will help me? And that is the kind of speech that we call loving speech. And that speech you can use naturally if uh, you have looked deeply into the suffering of that person. To, and you know that that person doesn't know how to handle his suffering. 
That, because that is why he make the people around suffer, including you. So contemplating suffering help you help compassion to be born in you. And if you have the energy of compassion, you can very easily use the language we call uh, loving speech, gentle speech. And that can really open the door of the heart of the other person. One, uh, one German uh, gentleman told me on the sixth day of the retreat in northern Germany that uh, dear Thay, I did not believe I can talk to him that way. I was so angry at him that I had vowed not to see him anymore in my life. And yet last night, practicing according to your recommendation, I called him, and when I hear his voice, suddenly I found myself capable of talking to him with that kind of, uh, of compassion. And he cried, my father cried like a baby. And we reconcile. And dear Thay, do you know something? The first thing I will do after this retreat is to go straight to him and see him. So the miracle of reconciliation can happen very quickly with the practice of compassion. And compassion, we know, that is born from understanding suffering. And we can practice uh, that with ourselves before we can uh, uh, help another person to suffer less. tradition, we speak of uh, love in terms of uh, true love, in terms of uh, loving kindness, compassion, joy, and equanimity, uh, uh, or non-discrimination, or inclusiveness. In order to really understand compassion, you should understand also the three other elements of true love. The first uh, element of true love is um, loving kindness, maitri. It has the power to offer happiness. If uh, love cannot offer happiness, it's not true love. It, your true love offer you happiness and offer him, offer her happiness. This, uh, it's not the willingness to offer happiness. Because if you don't understand the other person, the more you try to make him happy, the more you make him suffer. So understanding him, understanding her uh, suffering and need uh, before you can, you can practice uh, loving kindness, maitri. Uh, in Asia, there is a fruit called uh, durian. Uh, many people crave for it. <laughs> but for me, mm, I cannot eat it. And then you say, dear Thầy, he works so hard, he should uh, eat some durian. And then you make me suffer by loving me. <laughs> <laughs> so we should understand uh, the other person in order to really uh, make him happy. And that is why understanding is the other word for love, for compassion. And that is why uh, we should ask our partner, Darling, do you think I understand you enough? <laughs> if I don't understand you enough, please help me. My wife is right there. So, <laughs> 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 so, so my tree, loving kindness, is not just the willingness to, to make a, a person happy, but the capacity to make him or her happy, and that requires compassion, uh, understanding. And understanding requires time in order to look, to look deeply. 
And then the second element is compassion, which is a karuna. Uh, Greek compassion is called maha karuna. Compassion has the power to remove the pain, the suffering. If your love cannot make the other person suffer less, it's not true love. And you have to understand his suffering, her despair, in order to help him or her suffer less. And that is why uh, you need to have the time to look and to listen. And understanding will create uh, love and happiness. And the practice is that you have to apply that for yourself. You have to apply, uh, you have to be able to offer you happiness and compassion. Do we have enough compassion towards our body, our feeling? Do we know how to handle our body to make it uh, suffer less? Do we know how to handle a feeling so that we can help calm down a feeling or emotion that is self-love? The capacity to see, the capacity to love another person relies entirely on your capacity to love yourself and take care of yourself. That is true with compassion. And, um, and the third is a joy, mudita. If by loving you make the other person cry every day, that is not uh, true love. True love. <laughs> so you create, uh, you create joy for yourself and for the other person. And there are many practical ways to, to create joy without having to go to the market and buy something uh, to offer him or her. Suppose you say, uh, you breathe mindfully, and you bring your mind home to your body, you become fresh and pleasant, and you go to her and you say, darling, you know something? I'm here for you. How can you love if you are not there? <laughs> to love means to be there. <laughs> to be there for the person you love. If you are so busy in your, in your work, if you are so busy making money, and then you have no time for yourself and for your beloved one. And that is why mindful breathing, mindful walking, you know, to bring your mind home to your body, and to be uh, relaxed, fresh, and loving, and pronounce the mantra, darling, I am here for you. And you can, that is to bring joy for yourself and for the other person. And when you are truly there and offer your presence to him or to her, you have a chance to acknowledge the presence of the other person as something very precious to you. And that is why you can pronounce the second mantra. Darling, I know you are there, and I'm so happy. That is, to, to be loved means to be recognized as existing. And if you're, you drive your car, and you think of everything else except the person sit, sitting next to you, uh, she cannot be happy at all. So while driving, you use your mindfulness, embrace her, and you say, darling, you know something? I know you are there next to me. I am so happy. <laughs> so there are very simple practice like that. Practice of mindfulness can, that can bring joy. And if, uh, if uh, he is in the office, uh, you can practice the mantra of your telephone or send, in, send him an email with the content, darling, I know you are there and I'm very happy. <laughs> And that is why creating joy is true love. And the fourth element is inclusiveness. We cannot understand compassion deeply without understanding the fourth aspect of true love. In true love, there is no uh, discrimination anymore between the lover and the beloved one. You cannot say, that is, darling, that is your problem. (laughs) (laughs) 
In true love, your problem is my problem. Your happiness is my happiness. My suffering is your suffering. There is no longer any frontier. Inclusiveness. In true love, happiness and suffering are no longer individual matters. And if uh, you continue to love like that, you begin to embrace all of us into your love. Because these four elements of true love are called the four unlimited mind. There can never be enough. You begin with one person, and then if you follow the, pa- pa- the path of true love, your heart will open, 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 and you will embrace all of us inside. And that is true love is the kind of love that can enlarge your heart without stop, stopping. One day the Buddha was holding a, a, a glass of a, a bowl of water in his left hand. He's holding a handful of salt in the right hand and he poured the salt into the water and he stirred. And he asked the monks, my, my, my dear friends, do you think that you can drink that uh, water? It's so salty. But if uh, you throw that, uh, um, that amount of water into a big river, it will not make the river salty at all. And people, thousands of people continue to drink the water in the river. So with someone who has a great heart, a big heart, a lot of compassion, they don't suffer anymore. The things that make other people suffer do not make them suffer. It's like one handful of, of salt can make a salty uh, the bowl of water, but cannot make the whole big river suffer at all. So the four Brahma Vihara, the four elements of true love are unlimited because uh, by loving in that kind of way, one day you will embrace all of us in your heart. You, you love not only humans, but animals, plants, and minerals. Because minerals, they are alive also. Minerals can suffer. And that is the love recommended by the Buddha. The love without frontier, without discrimination. And the, f- the fourth element of true love is inclusiveness. No discrimination whatsoever. Black or white, uh, north or south, uh, rich or poor, are all objects of your love. And when you have that kind of love, you don't suffer anymore. And you are in a situation to help many people. And that is why all of us who want to serve uh, our society, uh, we should uh, cultivate uh, true love. With true love, we are nourished. You are strong enough. And if we know how to build a community of love, a love community, a compassionate uh, community, and then uh, we will be powerful enough to make change in our society. Um, I would like to make a few suggestions. Generating the collective uh, energy of uh, compassion should be a practice that should be done in a family, in the, in the hospital, in schools, even in the parliament. Uh, A guided meditation on meditation with 1,000 people can generate uh, a collective energy of compassion. And that can be felt. And maybe scientists have the way to measure the intensity, the degree of compassion. Because we can feel it. One day, uh, I gave a talk in Germany and I for 1,000 people. And I saw four young mother nursing the babies. 
and the baby were being fed by mother milk. But I saw that uh, the atmosphere in the home is so peaceful, so compassionate, because everyone was speak, uh, practicing mindful breathing, generating the energy of mindfulness, brotherhood, sisterhood, compassion. And I saw that the four children, but four babies, they are, they are having that kind of food also. And they feel it. They are very peaceful. Um, when we come together as a group like this, and if you know how to breathe, how to contemplate suffering, how to generate the energy of mindfulness, the collective energy can be very powerful. And if you happen to be in the zone of that energy, you get the healing. If you practice mindful breathing and focus your attention on your in-breath and out-breath, by doing so, you can stop the thinking, the mental discourse, because the thinking may take you away from the zone of compassion. So you cannot inherit uh, profit from that uh, that energy, uh, collective energy, compassion. Um, create such a collective energy of compassion is, is, is what we should uh, learn how to do. Because the best thing to offer to humankind and other kind species also. And please, as scientists, Tell us how we organize in order to, to offer the world that wholesome collective energy of understanding and compassion, because what, that's what we need. We cannot do the healing of the world unless we have enough of that energy, understanding, and compassion. Usually in a public talk, we begin with the chanting. We have about 100 or 200 monastics uh, uh, offering a chanting. Uh, in a few days, we have one in uh, Paramount Theatre. And uh, everyone uh, sitting in, in, in the audience, there may be 4,000 or 5,000 or more. In Hong Kong, we had uh, an audience of 10,000 people uh, attending the talk and practicing mindful, mindful breathing together. And we create a very powerful collective energy of mindfulness and compassion. The monks and the nuns, they have been instructed to chant the name of Avalokiteshvara, the great being of compassion. Uh, and uh, while chanting, they try to go home to themselves and touch the suffering inside of themselves. And the purpose is to allow compassion to be born. And when they chant for the second time the name, they reach out and recognize and touch the suffering in the people in front of them, on the left, on the right. And the, and the aim is the same, allow compassion to be born and to grow. And when they, they chant the third time, for the third, third time, the name of uh, the compassionate uh, Bodhisattva. They reach out and touch the suffering a little bit everywhere in the world. Asia, Africa, Middle East, South Africa, everywhere. Violence, war, death, uh, 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 despair, um, hunger, and so on. And the purpose is the same, generating energy of compassion. And the audience are, are advised to practice mindful breathing in order to stop the thinking and allowing the collective energy of mindfulness and compassion to penetrate into the body and help release the tension in the body and open the heart and allow the collective energy of compassion to penetrate into our heart, helping to embrace so that we can suffer less after a few minutes of practice. So that, that is the way we cultivate the energy of compassion, 
not only uh, individual energy, but the collective energy of compassion. And yesterday, uh, spending a day of practice with the uh, Google people, we asked them whether they, with technology, they can help us uh, organize in order to practice generating compassion together uh, as a community, as uh, uh, the community of uh, human beings. And uh, I think um, when you uh, guide, when you give a guided meditation on compassion and with image and sound and helping people touch the suffering in themselves, in their family, in society, you notice that uh, the energy of compassion is born easily and you can feel it. And when every time I sit with the monks and the nuns chanting and the people listening while breathing, I saw many people cry that the energy of compassion can be felt and it's very healing. And uh, we hope uh, mm, uh, you can teach us how uh, to do this on a greater scale because really our society needs that kind of energy. And we know that uh, compassion is made of non-compassion elements. We can make use of non-compassion element like anger, fear, suffering in order to create uh, compassion. If we have suffer, if we have fear, anger, despair, these non-compassion elements can be made, can be used as element to fabricate compassion. It's like the garbage. If uh, you are an organic gardener, you can preserve uh, these uh, garbage and transform them into compost in order to nourish the flowers. So with the suffering that we have in the world, if we know how to handle the suffering, we can transform them back into compassion and love. And uh, please uh, uh, seek care uh, with your studies. Help us to, to, to know how to do it uh, uh, more scientifically and uh, in greater scale. I think it's time for us to ask uh, a few questions. So if anyone uh, from the audience uh, has a question, uh, there are microphones here and here. This is compassion they're okay. fighting before. <laughs> Tay, uh, I wanted to ask you, uh, as a man in the Western society, I was raised, I was told not to cry. In sports, I was told to exploit the other team's weaknesses. In business, I'm told not to show any weakness. And I was wondering if you've seen this difference between how compassion in men and women, is it seems harder for men to generate this compassion. And if there's any way we can make compassion more attractive, maybe to men, more, um, you know, more, more of a strength than, I mean, than something. You know, I mentioned compassion to men that I talk to, and, and they walk away. They, they, they don't want to know anything about it. And I was wondering if you've seen that difference between men and women. And if you have any advice on how we can bring more men into the compassion movement. Dear, dear Tai, I would just like to repeat the, the question so that it is clear. Our friend is asking that uh, about the difference in compassion for men and for women. So growing up in Western society, 
um, he was taught not to cry. In sport, he was taught to exploit the weaknesses of others, and in business also. And so his question is how we can make compassion more attractive, more accessible for men, and if Thai might have any ideas, how to make it more appealing. Mm. There must be some uh, misunderstanding about um, the nature of compassion here, because uh, compassion is very powerful. Mm. If you think that compassion makes you weak, you are wrong. Mm. Compassion may cause a man, a person, to sacrifice his life for, uh, to save other people. And um, we have to redefine what is compassion. It's very powerful. And uh, we have to embody that kind of uh, energy uh, in our uh, in our uh, in our uh, daily life. We have to reeducate people about uh, this. Uh, uh, we have to show what compassion can achieve. Uh, when when someone is angry, uh, he is being burned by the fire of. Of, uh, of anger, and if he knows how to practice compassion, anger will die down very quickly, and he looks much better, much more beautiful, much, much more attractive. <laughs> and that is why we have to exemplify, is uh, embody that practice of uh, compassion in order to persuade other people to, uh, to do the same. Uh, compassion helps us to sleep well. Compassion protect us better than guns yeah. and uh, bombs uh, and money. Many of us think that uh, we are safer to, uh, if we have more money. But you can lose your money very easily. But compassion is a kind of energy that can help protect you much, much more uh, effectively than, uh, than money. And compassion helps you to relax and your body has more capacity to heal itself. Uh, uh, compassion helps uh, uh, you to be pleasant, to be loving, uh, and you can restore communication with the other person easily if you have compassion in yourself. You understand the other person. Uh, your compassion can help you do your business better because you are uh, in good relations with other people, including your employees, so you can list uh, 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 a lot of qualities uh, of compassion. And uh, we should have a man, a woman, a community of men and women practicing community, uh, practicing com compassion like that, in order to show people that compassion is something very powerful. And uh, I hope in the Department of Neurology, there will be a community practicing together and showing people, not by um, lectures only, but by the way of life. Uh, with compassion, we are much happier. We suffer much less. And we should embody our teaching by, by, by faculties and students. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. I feel so blessed to be in your presence, and I think I can speak for everybody here. Thank you so much. I just had a clarification question. I, um, a little, I'm practicing Buddhism, and practice is the operative word here. And I um, am understanding that one of the basic tenets of the Buddhist Dharma is the Four Noble Truths. And the first two are there is suffering, and the second one is, however, the good news is there's cessation from suffering. And I'm just a little confused. There's two things you said. One, one you said was in the kingdom of your kingdom of God that you hope there's still suffering. And then the second thing you said later on was 
if you develop a beautiful heart and a big heart, you'll be free from suffering. So I'm just a little confused. Dear, dear Thai, our friend is a practicing Buddhist and she would like some clarification from Thai about the relationship of what Thai has said this evening to the Four Noble Truths. The Four Noble Truths are a core Buddhist teaching um, that speak of the truth of suffering and also the truth of the end of suffering. And this evening, Thai has mentioned that uh, happiness or compassion and suffering inter are, um, and that in, in Thai's vision of the kingdom of God, of heaven, there would also be suffering in that place. At the same time, Thai has said that uh, we, if we, our heart is very big, then no matter how much suffering we throw into it, we don't suffer. So our friend is really asking, is it ever possible to be free of suffering? Is that what the, the noble truths are sharing? Or will suffering always be there? Uh, the truth is uh, suffering and happiness, they into are. They, they cannot be one without the other. And then there is the teaching of impermanence. Suffering is impermanent. If you know how to, uh, to practice, and then you can change the suffering into something else, like uh, happiness. And happiness is also impermanent. Yeah. And happiness can turn to be something else, like suffering. And uh, the first noble truth is about uh, suffering. And the third is about the uh, cessation of suffering. It means the transformation of suffering into something else like uh, happiness. Mm -hmm. In fact, the third truth is uh, ha happiness. And since uh, both, uh, mm, both uh, are impermanent, that is why even if you have happiness, you have to continue to practice. Uh, in order to maintain happiness uh, for a long time, because happiness has a tendency to go back to suffering. Uh, <laughs> and that is why you have to learn both the art of suffering and the art of happiness. Uh, the Buddha, he has a lot of compassion, but he has to suffer also. <coughs> When his uh, uh, eldest disciple Sariputra died, do you think that he suffered or not? The Buddha may have a headache <laughs> or rheumatism, and that is why the Buddha suffered also. But because he has a lot of wisdom and, understand, and compassion, that is why he suffered much less. And he knows how to make good use of suffering to generate uh, more compassion for himself and for other people. That is why, having become a Buddha, he continues to practice. Mm. So, <clears throat> so um, the practice is uh, to make good use of suffering in order to create happiness. Mm -hmm. And hap since happiness uh, impermanent, is impermanent, they, they, they they become suffering, and you continue to practice in order to transform suffering into happiness like that. The fact is that we have already enough suffering. We don't have to, to make more. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for coming, Jim, of course. Thanks for bringing this together. Um, I'm taken by the economy and the economics of the principles that you're describing for compassion and the balance of them and the counterparty relations between them. And I wonder when you look at the compost creating a flower, what you see in Wall Street that could create an economy of compassion. They do it all the time. Hmm. Tai has spoken this evening about the, 
the compost, being able to make uh, the lotus flower, and our friend is remarking on the economy um, and the compost that Wall Street might be, <laughs> and is wondering whether Thai feels there could be a positive flower growing from the, the compost of Wall Street and the way the economy functions. Yes, I think. Because uh, compassion is born from understanding. And understanding is a kind of insight that you get by having the time to look deeply. Every one of us has an idea of happiness. Uh, some of us think that uh, without a lot of money, we cannot be happy. Without uh, fame, power, and sensual pleasure, we cannot be happy. That is our idea of happiness. And that is why many of us uh, are running after these uh, objects of their craving. And if we have the time to look, we see that many people running after these four things, they destroy their body, their mind, their family. And even those who have plenty of these four things, they continue to suffer. And out of that observation, you realize that uh, true happiness is possible only with understanding and love and compassion. Without compassion and love, you can you are utterly lonely. And many rich people are very lonely, cut off from the whole old world. And um, without compassion, you can relate to any other human being. And that is why even if they have a lot of money, they suffer a lot, a lot of power, a lot of fame, they suffer very much. And many of them uh, commit suicide. And that is why uh, our practice is to experiment um, happiness, health, born from compassion. Our, our practice is also to help them to wake up to the insight that happiness is not made of these uh, elements. And that is why uh, compassion education is very important. What you've said tonight resonates very deeply. I will try to become more compassionate, but I struggle with even the idea of how I might be able to extend compassion to someone who might wish violence upon me or upon those that I love. I wonder if you might have suggestions for how those of us who have this struggle could extend compassion to those. You know that uh, <clears throat> during the Vietnam War, many young Americans came to Vietnam to kill and to get killed. Millions of uh, Vietnamese were killed in the Vietnam War. And yet with uh, the practice of compassion, you do not hate the American who come and kill us. Because uh, by practicing compassion, we know that they are also victims of a policy. And many policies uh, of our governments are based on fear, on fear. And that is why uh, the root of the war is uh, wrong perceptions and fear. And if we realize that we do not blame uh, uh, the person who makes us suffer anymore. A person who is happy, who is good, who is feeling good in himself, never makes you suffer. That person who has made you suffer, he has a lot of suffering in him. And that is why if you re recognize the suffering in him, and see him as uh, the object of his own uh, suffering. He has been in a kind of environment 
that um, that uh, that uh, that has water the seed of uh, violence, anger in him uh, every day. And that is why he has become such uh, a person, cruel person. If he was born in another place and receiving other kind of uh, uh, education, if he was surrounded by loving, compassionate people, he would not be like that. So he is a victim. And once you have seen that, your anger will be transformed and you will have compassion to him. And that is possible. And I mentioned uh, the war in Vietnam for an example. We have compassion for those who have come and kill us because we know that they are victims of a wrong policy. Just like everyone mentioned before, I'd like to thank you for being here. It's a great honor. And I'd also like to thank Dr. Doty for letting me enjoy this wonderful event. Um, my question is somewhat similar to the gentleman before me. It's about how to be compassionate towards a certain amount of certain people. In that sense, as a young adult who's maturing, I've constantly tried to open my perspective, become a more compassionate person. And I have trouble finding that not necessarily in those that are a threat to me, but those that I cannot understand. And what you said about compassionate listening and understanding really struck a chord with me. My question to you is, how do you understand those that might discriminate against others? For example, how do you understand those that sometimes I find difficulty even fathoming? For example, the Westboro Baptist Church or just anyone on the street who will be, who will be bigots or just people that are out there to hurt others, not necessarily a threat to myself. Dear Tai, our friend is asking a similar question about how we can have compassion for those to towards whom it's hard to have compassion. For example, those who are discriminating, those who are bigoted or limited in their views. Um, uh, our friend gave the example of people with extreme religious views, um, a particular Christian Baptist church that may be active on the campus here. Um, and so how can our friend cultivate the understanding that Tai spoke about this evening in order to grow compassion for these particular groups that are hard to understand? Mm, I myself have been victims of uh, discrimination a lot. It's difficult uh, to love, but it is possible. Uh, those uh, to love those who dis discriminate uh, against you. And, and my answer is somehow like uh, the answer I just offer. If you look deeply, you see those who discriminate against us, they have been formed like that, they have been taught like that. And, uh, and if uh, we are compassionate enough, and if we have a community who knows that knows the way to help the, these people to abandon that kind of uh, dogmas and, uh, and prejudices and discrimination, uh, that would be a great uh, compassion work. And uh, again, we have to sit down together, having the time to look deeply and to find way, uh, ways in order to help these people who continue to, uh, to, to, to make people suffer. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so the person before already asked my question, but I have another one. Um, <laughs> so so um, I have a friend who's depressed, and he, wants, he wanted me to ask this question about how does he improve his compassion fatigue when his mother, who has Alzheimer's, needs a lot of help, his two-year-old is creating a lot of energy pull, and his wife wants different things too, so it's like middle life crisis, I guess. Um, and so he just wanted me to ask you, like, what can he do to reduce his compassion fatigue? And 
or in, I guess this is a larger question, like when someone has a chronic illness that fatigues them, how do they keep their compassion towards other people and themselves? Dear Tai, our friend is asking a question on behalf of her friend, a man who is suffering compassion fatigue. He has many difficult drains on his energy at this time. His mother is suffering from Alzheimer's. He has a two-year-old child, and his wife is wanting different things from him. So he's fallen into a depression and has very low energy. So has Tai got any ideas for a way out, either for, for her friend in this particular situation or other people with, with illnesses that drain their overall energy level? How can such people facing challenging situations continue to cultivate and generate compassion? The answer is that uh, such a person would need uh, a community of practice that has uh, the power to generate uh, compassion, uh, brotherhood, sisterhood, and to spend time with that in order to uh, recover. I think uh, we all need uh, uh, nourishment. Uh, if we run out of, uh, we don't have nourishment, and then we run out of uh, joy and, and love and uh, everything. And that is why uh, he should be allowed a chance to, to rebuild himself. And uh, if he can spend uh, some time with a practicing community, learning how to get in touch with the healing and nourishing elements uh, in him and around him to nourish himself, learning how to uh, practice breathing, walking, and order to recognize and embrace the suffering in himself. And uh, learning how to uh, look uh, at the suffering of the people who have made him <coughs> suffer. I think such uh, a time of practice uh, would be necessary for uh, a person like him to to, uh, to restore himself um, and to live a normal life. Uh, the, the answer is that we need a Sangha. A Sangha means a community of practice that can uh, offer you uh, enough understanding and compassion. Thank you. Thank you. Con xin phép nói tiếng Anh, tại tiếng Việt của em không có rồi. Um, thầy, you uh, mentioned compassion, the way I understand it, of how you articulate that was very much compassion is a mirror of ourselves, our family, and society. And I recently have this opportunity to find that love and compassion within myself to understand my upbringing of what does Buddhism mean. My dad passed away not too long ago, and I tried to understand what the Buddhist um, ceremonies, which is part of his life celebration of the 49 days of, um, of chanting, what that meant, because I know there's different types of lineage of different types of Buddhism. And from what I've read and Googled, <laughs> there's so many different types out there. I'm struggling very hard to find my own truth of why do we have to do that 49-day ritual to honor my dad in a way because I find it conflicting because it's saying you have to suffer. You have to suffer for your father and become a vegetarian so he could cross over. Um, I don't know all the Vietnamese um, l scriptures when we pray. I just chant just to honor my dad, so I'm really struggling why we have to do that. When my dad was passing peacefully at home, I held his hand and I told him, Dad, you don't need to be forgiven. It's okay. 
you, you are an angel. You don't have to feel guilty or feel that you are left empty-handed or short-changed because it's okay. So I'm conflicted. I'm conflicted about honoring my dad with his religion, but yet I'm self-exploring my own compassion to understand where I, how I feel about the Buddhist religion and how it conflicts with my true belief of what compassion means. Can you help me identify that of why that ritual happens, what that means, and how does it tie in to self-transition of life after death and how the family honors a loved one that's passing? <clears throat> Dear Thai, our friend has Vietnamese roots and um, a Buddhist tradition in her family. Uh, she has recently lost her father and in order to honor his, his faith as a, a Buddhist, she wanted to practice the 49 days of mourning to honor her father's passing. She's been practicing chanting and also vegetarianism. In the research that she did online to understand this ritual more clearly, she felt that perhaps this is a type of penance, a suffering on her part in order to help her father's transition um, after his passing, and she would like some clarification from Thai on the roots of this Buddhist tradition of the 49 days um, of practice and to honor those who have passed away, mm -hmm. and how truly to have compassion, not to suffer during that time of mourning, but really to have compassion for the one we have lost. <laughs> when uh there is uh, popular Buddhism and deep Buddhism. And uh, I think uh, you should learn something about deep, deep Buddhism in order to have uh, a good uh, answer. According to the teaching of the Buddha, your father is not really outside of you. Uh, he is uh, in every cell of your body. And if uh, you know how to breathe in and relax your body, your father suffers less. That, that is what you can do right away and today. If you know how to handle your feelings, uh, your emotions, uh, get some joy and happiness every day, that is uh, for the profit of your father also. Usually, um, birth and death happen every moment of our daily life. In this very moment, many cells in my body are dying, and I do not have a time to organize their funerals. <laughs> <laughs> And at this very time, my many cells in our body are being born, and I do not have the time to celebrate their birthday either. <laughs> so birth and death happen in every moment. That day where uh, you, your father uh, was no longer in that form, that, that is not really the day of dying. And according to this uh, teaching, uh, the death of something is the birth of something right away. Suppose uh, we contemplate on the death of a cloud. A cloud can never die. The deeper teaching of the Buddha is the nature of everything is no, the nature of no birth and no death. On the first surface only, we see birth and death. But go going deeper, there is no birth and no death. And, um, and that is why the, the death, the so-called death of a cloud, means the birth of the rain or the snow. So, so the, the cloud does not need 49 days in order to be reborn as, uh, <laughs> as, uh, as uh, the snow. Uh, I uh, understand that. And that is why uh, if you have uh, uh, enough uh, mindfulness and and concentration, you can see your father, the continuation of your father, right in you and around you. 
and you don't have to look for, for him uh, elsewhere, and you can talk to your father right now. You don't have to suffer in order to make him uh, suffer less. In fact, you have to be happy, to be peaceful and relaxed in order to, for your fa father to, to be in the same kind of, uh, of uh, state. Please, yeah. Last question. Uh, I'm afraid our time together, uh, while it may seem extraordinarily brief, uh, we have had some wonderful uh, dialogue here, uh, but we have to close. So I'm sorry for those who are waiting for questions. Ty, thank you so much. It's been an, an amazing. It's a pleasure to thank be here you. with you, Dr. Dixon. And thank all of you. And, uh, Fill your life and every action with compassion. Thank you. Well, thank you. Oh.